Have you ever wondered where the young get all their energy? It is a question we often ask, but rarely accurately answer. Energy comes from the food we eat. First, our bodies use the sugars that we've eaten. When the sugars are used up, our bodies switch to using stored fats for energy. The enzyme that switches our bodies from using sugar to using stored fat has the unpronounceable name, carnitine palmitoyl transferase, or CPT1 for short. The job of this enzyme is to help change certain fats in the food we eat into energy we need to work and play and live healthy lives. But for a number of children in Alaska, this crucial enzyme is not working as expected. These children have lower levels of the CPT1 enzyme, which is called CPT1 deficiency. In some children, having lower levels of CPT1 can lead to serious illness and seizures. This is the story of how physicians, healthcare professionals, and parents are finding the disorder early and are helping babies and children with CPT1 deficiency live healthy lives. CPT1 deficiency is found mostly among people who live in the far north subpolar regions of the globe, in Alaska, northern Canada, and Greenland. Why the condition is mostly in the far north is largely a mystery. Why it is so common among Alaska Native people, especially in rural villages, is also still a mystery. One of the theories is that in the old days, when people in the Arctic had a more traditional diet, having lower levels of CPT1 allowed people to be healthier than people who had higher levels. This theory would explain why so many Alaska Native people have low levels of CPT1. It's also important to remember that CPT1 deficiency is not a disease. A baby or young child who has been diagnosed with CPT1 deficiency is perfectly healthy. And in time, as the child grows older, the risk of having any problems will decrease. But until that time comes, there are some very important things parents should know, which is what this story is all about. Even though doctors don't know why so many Alaska Native people have low levels of CPT1, much is known about the condition itself how to detect it and how to support and treat babies and children who have this very common gene. His name is Dr. David Kohler. He is a gene specialist at the Oregon Health and Science University and an expert on CPT1 deficiency. Today he is at a conference in Anchorage talking with community health aides and practitioners who are responsible for the care of these children and the education of their parents. So everyone's heard of CPT1. Let me stop. How many people have heard of CPT1 deficiency in Alaska? Okay. I never get that anywhere else other than Alaska. I'm amazed when I go and I was in Nome last week and all these people came to hear about CPT1 deficiency. It's, it's testimony to the people up here who've done such a great job of educating people. The Anchorage workshop brought together Dr. Kohler, the scientist who studies the disorder, Dr. Matt Hirschfeld of South Central Foundation at the Alaska Native Medical Center, a children's doctor who works with families at the hospital and in the villages and Thalia Wood with the State of Alaska, who helps to educate families about CPT1 deficiency. Together they are getting information about this newly recognized diagnosis out in the rural villages where the problem is most common. What they are basically telling parents is that in Alaska, every baby is tested for CPT1 deficiency as part of the newborn blood spot screening test. Screenings have shown that a milder form of CPT1 deficiency is common in babies of Alaska Native people. Most of these babies can make enough of the CPT enzyme between 10 to 25 percent to maintain good health. However, if a baby with even a mild form of CPT1 deficiency 
goes without eating for between six to eight hours, the child can get sick very quickly. This is especially true for a newborn baby who sleeps much of the time and could easily miss a feeding. Dr. Kohler and Dr. Hirschfeld share some of their experiences with parents in rural villages. They discuss what they tell families when their newborn's blood spot screening shows CPT1 deficiency. So how do you explain CPT1 deficiency to parents? What I tell the families is that the disorder affects their ability of their child to burn fats for energy. Normally we don't burn fats, we use blood glucose or our blood sugar for energy. But if we skip meals or fasting, then we start having to burn fat for energy. And if you have CPT1 deficiency, you can have a problem doing that. That's why kids get symptoms if they're fasting. What are the symptoms of a baby who's getting sick when they have CPT1 deficiency? Kids with CPT1 deficiency get the same kind of colds and other infections that other kids do. And initially, the symptoms are the same. The concern is that if they can't keep down fluids or can't eat, then they can have more symptoms like getting really sleepy. And in that case, the families need to take the kids to their local health care provider to be evaluated. What do you do if one of your kids gets sick in a rural village? The first thing you do is you try and uh, get some glucose-containing fluids in them, uh, be it breast milk or formula or Pedialyte. If the kids can take that without vomiting it up, then they can probably stay in the village. However, if you have a kid who's real sick and can't take any fluids, then you have to get them to a place where they can get IV fluids, whether that's the regional hub or if they can start an IV in the village and get IV fluids that way, that would be fine too. So does CPT1 deficiency cause brain damage or learning problems in kids when they're older? No, it really doesn't. As long as the parents are aware of it and they know what to do when their kids get sick, there's no reason to be worried about any long-term brain damage or other problems. If you have a kid who's diagnosed with CPT1 deficiency, should you test their older brothers and sisters? It's probably a good idea because, as I said before, even though older kids are less likely to have symptoms, it's a good idea to know in case those kids have to have surgery or something else happens, like a car accident where they have to go to the hospital. It'd be important for their health care providers to know that they have the disorder. Dr. Hirschfeld often visits patients and their families in remote rural villages like Teller on the northwest coast of Alaska. At the village clinic, he talks with Denise and her infant Alonza. A recent screening showed the child had CPT1 deficiency. So thanks for bringing Alonza into the clinic today. Um, I just want, I, I wanted to see you in the clinic mainly because I wanted to talk about something that we picked up on her newborn metabolic screen, which is that she has CPT1 deficiency, which is sort of a new diagnosis that we're picking up in a lot of kids from the coastal regions in Alaska. And what this is uh, when babies go long periods without eating or adults or older kids, they need to use fat for their energy. And this protein in your cells, what it does is it allows you to, to use fats for energy. And so in Alonza and lots of other kids in Alaska, this protein doesn't work quite right. It only works about 10% as well as it does in other kids. And so when babies like Alonza, if they have um, a cold or a fever or vomiting or diarrhea, and they're not able to eat for long periods of time, then what happens is, is they can't use fats for energy and they can get kind of sleepy and hard to wake up. And it can even progress to the point where they can start having seizures because they're not able to use these fats for energy. So that's the main reason I brought you here. Do you, do you have any questions? Mm, what are her health risks? The health risks are if she can't eat for somewhere between six to eight hours because she's not feeling well, because she's got a fever, she's got a cold, um, she may become very sleepy. And if she becomes very sleepy, obviously she's not going to be able to eat very well. And so you just have to remember that if that happens, if she's not able to eat for that amount of, period, that amount of time, then you'll have to bring her into the clinic to have her um, checked out and make sure that she's doing okay. And what they can do is they can look at her, and if, she, um, if they have trouble waking her up because she's so sleepy, they may have to put an IV in, or you may have to go to Nome um, for more medical care. Will she grow out of it? Uh, as she gets older, what will happen is she'll have more sugar stored in her liver, 
and more sugar in her blood. And so she's going to be able to have longer periods of time between eating where she won't have any problems. So she'll never actually outgrow CPT1 deficiency, but as she gets older, she'll have much longer periods of time between eating where she won't have any problems. Another of Dr. Hirschfeld's patients lives in Nome, high on the shores of the Bering Sea. It is here the legendary Iditarod Trail sled dog race ends. The first Iditarod race in 1925 was organized to deliver medicine to Nome when blizzard conditions made delivery by airplane impossible. Now Dr. Hirschfeld visits with Deidre Minnick and her daughter Chelsea. Chelsea has been diagnosed with CPT1 deficiency. How did you first find out that she had CPT1 deficiency? She was sleeping and that wasn't like her, so I had called my mother and she was, she said that maybe she's just growing. And it came around maybe four o'clock that I knew that something was wrong with her and I had Mama. woken her up and Mama. made. And we had brought her up to the hospital and they said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I told them that it's not like her to be sleeping all day long. And I told them that I wasn't going to leave until I found out that something was actually wrong with her. Mm -hmm. And they did blood work, they did urine. And a couple of days later they called me and told me to bring her back up. And that's when they told me what it was, that it was CPT1 deficiency. Right. When she was a baby, how often did you feed her? When she was a baby, she'd eat every couple hours, just like a regular baby. And uh, Does she have a snack before she goes to bed? Yes. Okay. She, and if we do forget about it, she will remind me <laughs> that she's hungry or she wants, she says, I want something. Okay. And to us, that's, she wants something to eat. Okay. Is she able to keep up with all the other kids at school? And Does she have the same energy as all the rest of the kids? She does, and right. sometimes more. Okay. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yes. And she's learning in school? She's and... doing excellent in school. She's just started all of her letters and oh, her great. name, and she's known colors and the alphabet and stuff, too. So she's doing good. She can't wait till it snows out to play out in the snow. So you can't tell a difference between her and any no. of the rest of the kids? No, nope. not at That's all. perfect. So the only thing you do is when she gets a cold or she has vomiting or diarrhea, then you just take her in a little bit yes. quicker than you would yes. go to the any other of my kids, yeah. Okay, you can take them in to see their doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you test your older daughter for CPT1 deficiency? They yes. And she was yeah. fine? Yes. A baby with low CPT1 levels has inherited two CPT genes, one from the mother and one from the father. It is possible that the parents do not pass the gene that causes low CPT1 levels to their other children, but these children should be checked at the clinic. An important thing to remember is that having low levels of CPT1 is not a disease. A baby or young child who has been diagnosed with CPT1 deficiency is perfectly healthy and in time as a child grows older, the risk of getting symptoms will decrease. But until that time comes, there are some very important things parents should know and should do. The key is to avoid going for a long time without food. Every baby needs to eat regularly even if it means waking the baby frequently throughout the night. Second, parents should know the warning signs. Know how to recognize a potential crisis, fever, diarrhea, or vomiting leading to extreme sleepiness and refusing food. Immediately take the child to the community health aid. It might be nothing serious, but it might be something where an IV is required, especially when your child hasn't been able to eat. Also, if your child needs surgery for any reason, be sure to tell the doctor that your child has CPT1 deficiency and should not go without glucose for more than a few hours. Finally, parents should know that having low levels of CPT1 is very common among Alaska Natives and other societies in the far north and you and your family are certainly not alone. In review, here is a reminder of when you should call your child's health care provider. 
If any of these conditions exist, it is very important to get medical advice or assistance. When there is fever, when the child is unable to eat for six to eight hours for any reason, when there is vomiting or diarrhea severe enough that the child cannot keep anything down for six to eight hours, when the child is lethargic and you can't wake the child up, when the child has seizures. If your child requires surgery for whatever reason, be sure to let your health care provider know that your child has CPT1 deficiency and shouldn't go without some kind of glucose for more than six to eight hours. And so, now you know where all that energy comes from. It is a resource of immense value, a resource that will power their young lives and ours into the future. A future in which we can say, energy crisis resolved. Mm -hmm.